In today's workplace, the issue of job safety has never been more important to the success of an organization. Litigation, lost productivity, and human costs can take an enormous toll if safety is not considered as job one. Each year, approximately 6,000 employees in the U.S. die from workplace injuries, while another 50,000 die from illnesses caused by exposure to workplace hazards. In addition, 6 million workers suffer non-fatal workplace injuries at an annual cost to U.S. businesses of more than $125 billion. In 1971, the U.S. Congress created the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, or OSHA, to develop and enforce workplace safety and health rules throughout the country. Other countries have similar agencies that mandate and enforce safety standards. The indirect costs of workplace injuries are even larger in terms of lost quality of life, personal financial ruin, operating costs of business, and decreased profitability. Employers and employees who work together to identify and control hazards on the job can save lives and money while improving business and productivity. Safety culture is a term used to describe the way in which safety is managed in the workplace and often reflects the attitudes, beliefs, perceptions, and values that employees share in relation to safety. Unfortunately, worker overconfidence is often a potential safety problem. The key to success is establishing a safety-based culture that starts at the top. Safety must begin with an organization's senior management team and promote that commitment down through the entire organization. When strong health and safety practices become part of the operational fabric of the organization, everyone wins. Although a positive safety culture begins at the top, it is still up to individual workers to obey all safety standards and practices and go beyond the call of duty to identify unsafe conditions or behaviors. Fiber optic professionals can be exposed to a wide variety of hazards ranging from the glass fibers themselves to chemicals used in cleaners and adhesives as well as the materials used in fiber optic cables. In addition, during installations, Fiber professionals often encounter heavy equipment, power tools, and the proximity to high voltages during cable placement and system restoration. The optical signals carried by the fibers can also pose eye hazards to the unwary. Most fiber optic systems today use laser transmitters. Even short distance multimode systems, which in the past used LEDs, have now migrated to low cost vertical cavity surface emitting laser sources. For this reason, all cables must be handled as if they were carrying a laser signal unless it's been verified by an optical instrument that no laser energy exists. It is the responsibility of the manufacturer to provide the correct classification of a laser and to equip the product with appropriate warning labels and safety measures as prescribed by regulations. In the United States, lasers are regulated by the Center for Devices and Radiological Health, or CDRH. A branch of the FDA, the CDRH is responsible for overseeing the manufacturing, importation, performance, and safety of all medical devices as well as devices that emit certain types of electromagnetic radiation, including cell phones, microwave ovens, and lasers. With lasers, the CDRH is concerned that the devices are properly labeled as to their output power and are equipped with the appropriate safety equipment if necessary. Safety measures used with the more powerful lasers include key controlled operation, warning lights to indicate laser light emission, a beam stop or attenuator, and an electrical contact that the user can connect to an emergency stop or interlock. A number of organizations have developed standards and guidelines for safely working with optical fiber, cables, and optical transmission equipment. These include the ANSI Z136.2, American National Standard for the Safe Use of Optical Fiber Communication Systems, Utilizing Laser Diode and LED Sources, and the OSHA Standard on Laser Safety STD 0105001. For international use, the IEC 6825-1 covers the safety of laser products, and the IEC 6825-2 covers the safety of Optical Fiber Communication Systems, or OFCS. Another standard issued by the International Telecommunications Union is the ITU TG.664 recommendation, which covers optical safety procedures and requirements for optical transport systems. For construction, the Telcordia SR1421 Blue Book is a detailed manual of construction procedures and contains numerous safety references for all types of physical plant construction. 
Used for outside plant, the ANSI Z117.1 standard covers safety requirements for confined spaces, and its provisions must be strictly adhered to when working in vaults, manholes, or any other type of confined space. Whereas the construction hazards of a fiber optic transmission system are temporary, the potential optical hazards will exist throughout the entire working lifetime of the system and will affect not only the installation personnel, but future maintenance technicians and even end users as well. The ANSI Z136.2, as well as other standards, divide laser devices into a set of four general classes and several subclasses based on their wavelength and optical power output. The first version of the standard was published in 1988 at a time when laser-based fiber optic communication systems were very simple. They used only two wavelengths, 1310 and 1550 nanometers, at maximum power levels well under 10 milliwatts. The standard was the first written specifically for fiber optic communication systems. However, laser and fiber optic technology developed rapidly through the 1990s. Erbium doped fiber amplifiers along with DWDM and high density ribbon fibers began to fundamentally change the optical communication landscape. Higher laser powers at more wavelengths prompted the ANSI to revise the standard in 1997. Since then, DWDM has established a firm grip on metropolitan networks and long-haul spans. Vertical cavity surface-emitting lasers have completely displaced LEDs in most LAN applications, and advanced dispersion management technology has greatly increased transmission distances, prompting the use of higher power laser transmitters and erbium-doped fiber amplifiers, or EDFAs. In today's DWDM systems, it is not uncommon to find optical power levels in individual fibers exceeding several watts, High-density fiber ribbon structures are also common in fiber optic cables with each fiber carrying laser energy. Another trend in optical communications is the free space system, where modulated laser energy is projected across open space without the use of optical fiber. These systems use communications lasers operating at standard wavelengths. This technology is gaining popularity based on various advantages, including the fact that the optical spectrum is not regulated by the FCC so frequency coordination and licensing is not required. These advancements have allowed modern optical communication systems to pose hazards significantly greater than in the past. This is why standards must continually evolve to meet current needs. In 2007, the IEC 6825-1 standard underwent a reorganization of the laser classification system, where a number of subclasses were added to better define the hazards posed by laser devices. This was further updated using the optical fiber communication systems as defined in the 6825-2 standard. Briefly, a class 1 laser system is considered to be incapable of producing damaging radiation levels during operation and is exempt from any control measures or other forms of surveillance. A class 1M laser is incapable of producing hazardous exposure conditions during normal operations unless the beam is directly viewed through an optical instrument such as a loop or a fiber inspection scope. For this reason, the M stands for Magnifying Optics Caution. Class 1M lasers are also exempt from control measures other than to prevent direct viewing of the beam through optical instruments. Class II lasers emit in the visible part of the spectrum between 400 and 700 nanometers. Eye protection is generally provided by a person's natural aversion response to bright lights. Class 2M lasers emit in the visible part of the spectrum and also rely on aversion responses for eye protection, but can be hazardous if viewed through optical instruments. Class 3 or medium power lasers are divided into two subclasses, 3R and 3B. While the B has no special meaning other than a means of dividing class 3 lasers, the R stands for reduced requirements. Class 3R lasers have reduced product safety requirements and represent a transitional zone between safe and hazardous laser products. A Class 3 laser may be hazardous when directly viewed, and its specular reflection off a shiny surface may also be hazardous. Diffuse reflections off surfaces like walls or paper is generally not hazardous. Class 4 lasers are high power lasers whose output is a hazard to eyes or skin from the direct beam, specular reflections, and in some cases, even diffuse reflections. Class 4 lasers often have sufficient optical power to be a fire hazard as well. 
The classifications relate specifically to the laser itself and its potential hazard based on operating characteristics. However, the conditions under which the laser is used, the level of safety training of the individuals using the laser, as well as environmental and other factors are important considerations in determining specific safety control measures. These situations require the informed judgment of a responsible person, namely the Laser Safety Officer or LSO. The LSO has the authority and the responsibility to monitor and enforce the control of laser hazards and affect the knowledgeable evaluation of Class 3 and Class 4 hazards. An LSO is required when the employees of an installation or maintenance organization routinely encounter optical power levels of Class 3B or Class 4. Today, most optical signals are laser-based, with low-power, low-speed LEDs now used only in the simplest and shortest links. Fiber systems that use LEDs emit non-coherent energy at wavelengths longer than 700 nanometers at power levels considerably less than laser diodes. Since the potential risk of eye injury is determined by the output characteristics of the optical fiber system, including power, coherence time, wavelength, and beam divergence, it is less for an LED than for a laser. However, for the purpose of uniformity, all control measures for use with a specific hazard level apply equally to laser diode and LED systems.